Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a little poem, The Ox Tamer, poem number 32 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. We have uh, commented already a number of times in earlier lectures of this section, Autumn, of or related to the old, the ancient, and rivulets, that which is uh, going to be associated with the new. Here, in this poem, we're going to have a celebration of the artist, by an artist looking at another artist. However, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of taming oxen. Now, for a good number of us, this is going to be something we're unfamiliar with until we maybe start thinking about the taming of horses. And I want to dedicate, actually, this lecture to my uh, to my good pal, Dean Barrett, and his young protege, Jade uh, Foss, who both of them spend a lot of time taking care of ponies and have taught me already a tremendous amount. We live, of course, out here where so much of this happens. And this poem is going to be able to, I think, be understandable for many of us by virtue of that. I mean, there's not as much taming of oxen anymore. However, you might want to Google this because you will find, in fact, celebrations of ox tamers in, uh, in, in eulogies of great ox tamers. Well, in cultures where oxen are used, as of course they would have been in, in Whitman's time, used for farming and for agrarian work, then having somebody who could come in and tame an ox was an invaluable resource. And very much like Sparkles from Wheel, an earlier poem of Autumn Rivulus, we're going to be playing around, there it was the knife sharpener, we're going to be playing around with a certain kind of artist that in Whitman's time was already beginning to go away, of course, because of the rise of technology. Now our assumptions are that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Waldorf Playlist, and you've been with us from the very beginning, the early inscriptions, poems, up through and including a set of comments that were introductory to auto rivulets, and I'm hopeful that you uh, are already familiar with that. And then we just finished with O Star of France. Now, um, our Nortons will tell us about this poem that was first published in the New York Gra uh, Daily Graphic, December of 1874, in a miscellany of prose and verse called A Christmas Garland, but apparently composed as early as 1860, for it's one of the ten poems listed by Thayer and Eldridge in an advertisement of that year for the never-published Banner at Daybreak. The poem appeared in Two Ripulets, 1876, and then finally in Lisa Grass, 1881. Now, I find this a fascinating read, because as we often will say, great poets show instead of tell. So notice the way in which he will play this game of repeating, see you, see you. In other words, he's challenging you, the reader, to see what is being spoken of. And I will say that of my, of my friend Dean Barron and of his young protege, Jada, I love to watch them work with ponies because there is artistry here that I cannot comprehend in any real way. I mean, I, I know Whitman, ponies not so much, and yet I love to watch what's happening in here. We're going to have an appreciation of the ox tamer. Having said that, let's put this already at 2B. Whitman is going to play the game of symbolism here. In what ways is a good trainer a good artist? And in what way is a good artist a good teacher, and therefore students recognize that teaching as art? Let's play the game here. In a far away northern country, in the placid pastoral region, lives my farmer friend, the theme of my recitative, a famous tamer of oxen. Let's pause for a moment. Far away, we've heard eight times in Leaves of Grass, and so this idea of being remote is part of this. Northern country, of course, taking us away. You'll remember this far away in recorders ages hence, um, happiest days uh, were far away, you'll maybe remember this. Um, in the placid pastoral region, seven times in Lisa Grass, pastoral gets used, you'll remember it in starting from Pominac 14 for the first time. His use of recitative we've seen as well already used. That is to say, reflection, my, my musings on what it is, and notice it is my farmer friend, a famous tamer of oxen. Now again, we normally would think of people who would be famous as doing really other kinds of work than this, and yet notice that for Whitman, all work is precious. There is nobody who does any kind of work that's set beneath. Everybody is equal in that regards. And all great work is all, uh, for, all, uh, for all of Whitman is always about artistry. Go back to I Hear America singing the very carols I hear and all those different types of workmen and women that are mentioned. Now back to the ox tamer. There they bring him, the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds, to break them. It's going to be break and tame, and yet 
It's interesting language when we get into the poem. He will take the wildest steer in the world and break him and tame him. He will go fearless without any whip. That's a key. If you're going to especially read this poem as symbolism as it relates to educational pedagogy, the way to train children, without any whip where the young bullock chafes up and down the yard. The bullock's head tosses restless high in the air with raging eyes. Of course, this is great here showing, not telling. Yet, see you, and you'll, and you'll notice we're going to see this uh, repeated several times now. Yet, see you, how soon his rage subsides, how soon this tamer tames him. See you, on the farms hereabout, a hundred oxen, young and old, and he is the man who has tamed them. They all know him. All are affectionate to him. In other words, symbolically again, right? What is it that makes great teachers great teachers? Their students somehow are drawn to them. See you. Some are such beautiful animals, so lofty looking. And of course, to see great steers, to see great oxen, one must marvel at, of course, the, the upbringing, the genetics, and, and, and all of it. But of course, they're also frightening animals that they're so large and they have to be in some way utilized, tamed, you know, and, and, and here, we're gonna celebrate an artist who can do that. By the way, notice all the coloring here will remind us of another poem, A Child Went Forth. Some are buff colored, some molded, one has a white line running along his back, some are brindled, and of course, this tells you, this is something Whitman actually witnessed growing up, of course, on the farm. Some have wide flaring horns, a good sign, right, and obviously, our, our Texas Longhorn lovers here will say hook 'em horns. See you the bright hides. See the two with stars on their foreheads. See the round bodies and broad backs. How straight and square they stand on their legs. What fine, sagacious eyes. And again, notice the exclamation points that start to get used here. How they watch their tamer. So notice this use of the, the repetition of the word tamer and tame. How they watch their tamer. They wish him near them, how they turn to look after him, and what yearning expression, how uneasy they are when he moves away from them. And again, to read this poem, literally it's beautiful, but it can also obviously be read symbolically. Great teachers are always being somehow um, followed by their students, right? Now, he says, I marvel when it can be he appears to them. And then in parenthetics, books, politics, poems, depart. All else departs. In other words, all of the learning of school is set aside in a moment like this. And, you know, there is a good argument to be made that if we really wanted to help young students in America's public schools, we'd take them out and let them watch someone work ponies. And there's a whole lot that you learn in that moment about, yes, not just horse nature, but human nature as well, right? He says it. I confess... I envy only his fascination, my silent, illiterate friend. It's interesting, he uses the word illiterate. In other words, there's things that can be known even if you can't read. And for Whitman, he's going to celebrate those as being equally, maybe even more important. Whom a hundred oxen love there in his life on farms. It's interesting, he uses the, the word love. In the northern country far, in the placid pastoral region, well, what are we going to say about a poem like this? Well, I think one argument is just simply that an artist always loves watching other artists work and create. doesn't matter. And any, anybody who's an artist is always fascinated by watching somebody who has command of his or her craft. And obviously, I would, I, I, I would second it. It's one of the reasons I mentioned uh, um, Dean Barron and, and Jada Foss. They, they, their ability to do this work, and I'm... Very, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in watching them because they're so concentrated, they're so focused. It's always fun to see it. By the way, at 2B, rhetoric here, notice this use of CU repeated, C, C, C over and over again. He wants us to appreciate, right? And we do this often when we talk, wow, look, look at how, they're, how well they're doing it. Well, great, again, great poets show instead of tell. And obviously the symbolism of what, if, if, what is a great teacher? Well, a great teacher is like a great ox tamer. In other words, there's uh, the ability to work without the whip, right? You'll remember in an earlier story, I told you that one of the reasons Whitman didn't remain a teacher for very long is that he was instructed he had to paddle the students who got in fights, to which Whitman asked, why would I paddle a student for hitting... Why would I hit a student for hitting another student? It doesn't make any sense, and he didn't last long in, in public schools. Finally, at, at 3A, 
well, we mentioned the idea of ponies, and so I will tip my hat to maybe one of the greatest of those films, Man from Snowy River, of course, the 1982 film, but I'm really interested in the poem that that film was built from, the poem by the Australian Bush poet, uh, Banjo Patterson, and that's an 1890 poem. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe some of you will run that one to ground and study that one. It's a wonderful poem. Why does this poem end up in Autumn Rivulets? Well, I think the, po the point that Whitman is making, Autumn, overrelated to the old, that is to say the old ways, the teaching ways of this ox tamer, and then, of course, why the rivulets, the new, I think he's making an observation about school. It, is, it can't be lost on us that the poem that will follow this poem will be about an old man and school, and school children. So we'll, we'll be ready to join that one in a second. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own a poem like this, a text like this? Well, I, I, I can ask it this way. Who is the artist? And again, we use that term in its most expansive use. Who is the artist that you love to watch, you love to work? I'm hopeful maybe that Whitman is becoming one of those artists that you love to study and watch. Thank you.